And other patients I've had has, has said that, you know, when I add a heel lift to their shoe, sometimes the knee pain gets worse, and as I drop the heel of their shoe, their knee pain gets better. So this is something I think is going to require further research to understand. We also show that many in barefoot running that we tend to have some studies are showing that the uh, pronation is worse in barefoot running, but we also see some studies that show that the barefoot running did increase what's called internal tibial rotation. In other words, internal tibial rotation is when the foot pronates, the whole leg will go inward or internally rotate. There seems to be half the studies showing that the tibia does internally rotate more in barefoot running and other studies have done. So it's really, the pronation thing isn't too black and white yet. So I think it's going to depend on if the patient hits forefoot first, if they hit rear foot first. When you put a shoe on, it makes it difficult also. When you put shoes on, it makes it difficult because to put the markers on the foot, you have to put it uh, in the shoe and cut holes in the shoe to see the markers. And so that's another technical issue that we have difficulties with. What's ITR? I'm sorry? Oh, I just saw some language there. ITR? That last oh yeah, thing. I'm sorry, internal tibial rotation. I'm oh, sorry goodness. to explain that. Internal tibial rotation. Then, so explain that again, is that when the foot pronates, so let's say my right foot's hitting the ground and it pronates or rolls inward, that's okay. going to bring the knee and the tibia internal. And so they, what they can do for to measure internal tibial rotation, what they do is I'll a, put a marker set on the tibia, and they'll actually put a set of uh, like little cluster of balls that are reflective. And then they have a three-dimensional uh, system, video system, generally four or five cameras that are tied to a computer, so they can actually track those balls in space during the running. And that's how they do. I mean, you guys have seen the basketball games uh, where they have the guys doing realistic movements. To those, they put them in body suits with all these markers on them, and they track them, and that's how they get those realistic movements. It's, it's called 3D uh, camera <coughs> or 3D motion analysis, and this is the way they're doing all these studies now in the last 10 or 15 years. So, getting to your question on metabolic efficiency. Now that's real interesting because this is where I think barefoot running has clear superiority over shoes. Is that this, and this study just came out, it's actually not even, it's even, you probably have a friend. So this, this study is from the International Journal of Sports Medicine. It's not been published yet, but it's on the, uh, it's in the paper showing that these guys ran, uh, they ran 10 runners with shoes and barefoot. And they measured the perceived exertion, they measured the heart rate, <coughs> and they measured the, um, the oxygen uh, uptake. Oxygen uptake is where they, you have to basically measure the oxygen, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide exhaled. And this is when I was a physiology major at UC Davis. I worked in the exercise lab at UC Davis a lot. So I, I was involved in studies like this. In fact, one of the studies I was involved in, which is kind of gross, it was on, uh, you guys are laughing, you know, kind of studies you do in the picture is that it was a skin and core temperature measuring. So actually, I was running for an hour and 15 minutes on a treadmill in a hot human room with skin thermometers on and with a rectal probe. Oh, measuring for at about a 6:30 mile pace. Oh, that's which was part of the study to measure my core. That's how you measure core temperature. So that was a lot of fun. That was fun. What did they pay you for that? Dollar an hour? Yeah, that believe me, they paid for that one. You know, it was it was. Uh, I'm the interest in science, so this is you know this is uh, dedication. You know, little thin little thing, and that's uh, that was a great great experience. But uh, anyway, but I'm telling you, this is what. This is what uh, the uh, research is all about, is that you're, you're studying you know, different physiolog physiologic and biomechanical processes in the, in the runners and trying to understand uh, what's happening from a scientific aspect. But let me go on just to answer your question. Um, the uh, cost of the running now, some people say, well, how do shoes add to the energy expenditure? Because when we move our foot forward during the swing phase, we have extra mass at the end of our legs. So it's just like those of you who play baseball, when you play baseball, you swing the bat, before you swing the bat, you go up, you put a, a donut on the, on the bat, and you swing, and it becomes heavier, right? Think of having uh, something, swing something with a weight at the end, it's much harder to swing. That's what happens when we run, we put any weight on our foot. The, it seems like that all the, all the research is showing that adding masses to shoes makes you less energy efficient because you're carrying more weight. Anyone who has raced, 
like I did, and many of you in the room have run, you put your thicker sole training shoes to do the heavy training. When you get on the, on the track or you're out there in the road race, you wear a thin, light racing flap. And this has been done for 40 years. It's nothing new. But we did it because we felt fast, and well, it shows that we were fast. We were actually faster because we're carrying less weight. So this is what we did, and this is what the guys, you don't see guys running, the elites in the Boston Marathon running a thick sole shoe. They wear the thinnest sole shoe they can wear that's comfortable, that feel they're not going to get injured. So one of the interesting studies they're actually looking for to see if it's actually the mass effect, adding mass to the legs is the cause of the uh, injury, I'm sorry, cause of the lack of uh, the increase in oxygen consumption, and they uh, compared that to running in a, in a diving sock with that set of weights added to it, and they found that the higher metabolic cost was due only to the extra mass added rather than some sort of biomechanical effect from the shoe. So this means that when we run barefoot or run on a thinner shoe or a lighter shoe, we're going to be using less oxygen per mile which means we're burning less energy, which means that the perceived exertion or the, the feeling of uh, working hard is going to be lessened as we have a lighter shoe. Now there was a follow-up question. Was there a question? Yes. Um, I, don't, I can't take too many questions, but I'll take one right now. If you're just trying to get exercise and not raising, is that, is that a negative? <laughs> uh, you, you can make that, yeah, you can say if you want to, give, you want to burn more calories, and yeah, you could put weights on your legs. I would suggest doing it. But yeah, but you know, it just it kind of takes away from the pleasure of running, I think, for me. I mean, uh, you know, running at age 54 is hard enough versus 24, right? But uh, that's, you know, that's certainly, that's, that's uh, certainly something you could do and something that back in the old days they used to recommend running with ankle weights. You know, that was going to increase the strength of your legs and make the burn wash. So one of the questions that I have, and this is something that I've actually asked many, I actually went on the international, there's an international biomechanics webpage, and this is a question that I posed to the authorities and in all the international biomechanics community. <coughs> if we know that running barefoot <coughs> is so much more energy efficient because of less mass, why aren't the elites doing it? Now that's, that's a good scientific question because <coughs> you would think that if it's more energy efficient, that you would be seeing the guys hopping in the race, they'd be barefoot, right? I mean, I would think that if that was the only case. So that's the <laughs> question. Why aren't the elites running barefoot? If you look at all the current world track and field road racing records, none of them are set barefoot. They're all set in shoes. So obviously the elites know something that maybe we don't know, or maybe <clears throat> the barefoot enthusiasts won't admit to. We know that from all the research, there seems to be no that when we take have less weight on our feet, that we use less oxygen consumption. So why wouldn't a uh, elite not want to have uh, a speed a speed uh, advantage over his fellow runner by taking off his shoes and have the least amount of mass on his feet? So why aren't more of these runners racing barefoot? One of the pieces of research and they answer that question is that they did a study and these were and these guys are fast. These are 20, 33 track athletes in there. They measured these guys and they took the track athletes who are the best on the team and the, and all all the ranges and they see they're trying to see what was the difference between the fastest athletes and the slowest athletes. They're still you know competitive athletes, but some guys were you know ahead of the others. What made them faster runners? And the thing that they measure that they found to be a faster runner is that the guys who are faster exerted more force on the ground. So that means that as you run faster and faster, you're going to put more and more pressure between your, your foot and the ground. So there's more force, more chance for injury. In fact, these guys are running anywhere from a 419 mile pace to a 9.01 second 100 meter pace. So these guys were not snobs. So these guys were comparing. That's the range of uh, speeds they had. So the other thing we have to contend with in our, uh, in my business as a sports podiatrist, we have to hear the runners coming in and say they've, they're, they've, they've heard from all their friends that I shouldn't be heel striking. We're going to run <coughs> differently. We're going to run with a pose method. We're going to run the chi running. We're going to run 
they read on the Runner's World website that the slower runners run heel striking and the fast runners run midfoot. Mid foot. So since I want to go straight to, straight to <coughs> the fast side, I forget the slow side, I want to go right straight to midfoot. What does a research show? They actually did a study of this. It took 16 70 triathletes. They split those into the Coe's group. Now, the Coe's running is a, a running method where they teach you to not run on your rear foot, but to strike on your mid foot. Shorter strike. They're teaching you to bring the ground underneath your, bring the foot underneath your center gravity when you run, take shorter strides, and the Coe's method. And this is kind of the Coe's method. You pose like this, and this is how you're supposed to. Well, what's interesting about this, they actually, they did oxygen cost and found that in the control group, there was no increase in oxygen cost over this 12 week period of training pose, but the people who were trained in pose method, actually, they become less efficient. So they probably went from a heel striking method to this, assuming this new pose method, and found that there's 7.6% increase in their oxygen uptake for a given uh, a given running <coughs> speed, whereas the non-pose people show no difference. And one thing the pose did, so if their stride has decreased, and the vertical oscillation, so their up and down movement decreased the pose method. So this is further evidence of showing that maybe heel striking isn't so bad. I mean, maybe all this stuff we see on the internet and here at the running group sites that you should be a rear foot striker, or you should be a mid foot striker, a forward foot striker, not a rear foot striker, well, we're certainly not seeing that in the scientific research. Matter of fact, one of my friends who uh, does work at Joe Hamill and his group out at the University of Amherst has done a what's called a four dynamics computer study. Four dynamics computer study. Basically, what they do they model the they model the body and they know what the forces and the alignments of the um, muscles are in the leg and they try to figure out what's going to be the most energy efficient way to run. Is it the rear foot strike or mid foot strike? And their model which they modeled at a 642 mile pace, and here's the pictures from the paper, they showed that running heel striking was actually 6.3% difference. It was more economical than running midfoot striking. Now, why could that be? Why would heel striking, we heard that heel striking is such a bad thing. Well, possibly heel striking is more efficient because we can take a longer stride when we heel strike. And that's what my feeling is, is that when you're running and you're trying to lengthen your stride, Obviously, you don't want to overstride, but you also don't want to shorten your stride or cut your stride down more. So there's going to be that optimal strike length. <coughs> Some people are going to be naturally rear foot strikers, depending on the speed they're going, and other people are going to be naturally mid foot strikers. Some people are going to be four foot strikers. And this is what we see, and this is what I've seen for the last 30 years of looking at runners and actually being a runner for over 40 years. So is that you're going to have a certain subset of people who tend to naturally select rear foot striking, another subset that that's like root bit for striking. And I think the biggest mistake is we try to get them out of one natural type of what they do and try to put them into something they're not accustomed to. Now, of course, that's going to depend on the shoe height. If the heel height is increased, they're going to be more of a rear foot striker. If they run in a vibe room where they have no heel height differential, in other words, the forefoot and rear foot height are the same, you're going to have more of those people tend to be a mid foot striker and a forefoot striker. So, I think that the question is, I, one of the comments I, I just gave this lecture at a conference, the biggest conference on the West Coast, Pro Conference on the West Coast on uh, Friday, just a few days ago. And I was talking to one of my buddies, we ran together, but I just grew up, I said, when I was running, and I was racing, the last thing I thought about was the guy in front of me, was he a four for strike and a rear for strike? I just want to beat him, right? I mean, you know, there's something that <coughs> there's mid foot and four for strike and stuff, that I, I just, I, 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 I just kind of laughed at it because I didn't care what the guy behind me was because I was beating him. The guy in front of me, I was just trying to beat him. I could care less how he's putting his heel on the ground. I was trying to get him. So, you know, we kind of laughed at that because you know, that's, that's the way you think when you're in a race situation. You're not worried about this. And this, this whole mechanical thing of how you should rear foot strike and forward strike, I think is overblown and being talked to death because it's a point of conversation. So, this asks the question, why would barefoot running limit racing speed? It seems to be the case. We don't see the elites running barefoot in races. We don't see any of In fact, when you go to the race and you look at the barefoot numbers, how many do you see? You're looking at probably one-tenth of a percent of runners at most. I, California National Marathon, I go watch it every year. Maybe one or two barefoot runners out of 8,000. Hmm. 